subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Welcome to SHR on Joy Learning or Joy TV. I'm your facilitator, Sir Kwame Martin, who will take you through a topic in Form 2 Biology. Previously, we studied the classification, or we began classification. We have looked at topics like the history of classification. We have looked at the ranks in classification. And we started with the five kingdoms of classification. We then went to look at the characteristics of most of the ranks of each kingdom. We then looked at kingdom protista, kingdom fungi, animalia, sorry, plantae, and now we are on kingdom animalia. Get ready. Let's begin. Have your notebooks. And take your time and look at whatever I'm going to present to you. Today's lesson, we are just going to tell you a, lit a little more of organism you may know or may not know. Whatever I'm going to tell you are the characteristics scientists or biologists have all agreed are the accepted characters for classifying organism into such classes. But before we go on, let's look at the entire kingdom animalia. We said all animals, including you watching me, and tiny animals, even parasites in you, are all multicellular and they are eukaryotic organisms. I think we've explained this some time ago. The next thing is the nutrition. Plants are autotrophic, as we studied, but for animals, we are heterotrophic. We are either holozoic or we are parasitic. We can be saprophytic, but those are for the fungi group. One other unique feature of animals is that usually they move on their own or uh, harnessing power from their within to force them to move compared to some other organisms. The few animal-like organisms we saw were in prototest. Usually these were animals at cell level. But the organisms we are going to study in kingdom animalia, usually, except few like sponges and co who are at cellular level, all the organisms that we will talk about usually are tissue or above those levels. So either they are tissue level, organ level, or system level. Usually, animals are at system levels. Then they mostly reproduce as we go on the evolutionary tree, or as we climb up to the complex one, you find that most of the organisms are reproducing sexually. That may to involve gametes from two different parents fusing. Only few, those at the lower level, some exhibit some amount of asexual productive methods. For your level, and at the SHS level, there are eight phyla we'll look at. But if you read any other textbook, there are many more than eight. But as I said, when we started classification, I said the reason why we choose few are those that we think are for your level to study and their characters also cut across a lot of organisms. So we have phylum, nidaria, and check when I'm using the word phylum. In plant, we use division. Here we use phylum. And look at the last words, phylum, nidaria. But if I'm just talking and putting the action or verb for my say nidarians, or just trying to refer to the members, I say nidarians. But if I'm talking about the phylum or phyla, I say nidaria. We have phylum platyomentis, 
they are the flat worms. The nematoda are the round worms. Phylum and anida are the segmented worms, like the earthworm. Phylum mollusca, that's where snails belong to. Phylum atropoda, where we have insects and crabs. Phylum ethnodermata, hardly do you see them around, but we'll get to them. Starfish. Then, where human beings we belong to, phylum chordata. We also have fish, toad, birds, reptiles in this group. From the 1 to 8 on your screen, you see that I have just labeled the 8 as vertebrates, those with backbone. The first 7, because they don't have these form of backbone or hardened structures in them, refer to them as invertebrates. So in the animal kingdom, we divide them into vertebrates and invertebrates. If you read other books, you get to other classifications, which are a little bit advanced than this. Before we go on to, I'll be using some concepts and I want you to get it right so that when I get there, I'll not repeat myself. Some we've already studied in year one and also coming to year two. The first thing that I would help remind you is the symmetry. We have bilateral symmetry, radar symmetry, spherical symmetry, and asymmetrical symmetry. Usually, what we we'll use here is the bilateral and radar. So I'll show you a picture from our Form 1 study. So the red on your left is your bilateral symmetry, and the orange on your right is your radar symmetry. Bilateral means there's only one line of cut down when you use you can get two equal halves that are mirror images but if you are radar it means that you can use more than two different line of cut each line that you use you get two equal halves which are mirror images then very soon i explain body layers called diploblastic and triploblastic then also during that stage, I'll explain body cavity, which is silom, acylomate, and pseudo -silomate. When you use, when you talk about reproductive methods, we are talking about those that involve only one parent giving birth, or using only one parent giving birth to young ones, or producing young ones as asexual. When it re requires two different parents producing gametes, that comes together to fuse to form a zygote before it moves on to the organism, forming a younger form of the organism. Then we are saying it's asexual. Nutrition for animals, you are usually holozoic or parasitic. Then in movement or lifestyle, we have those that move freely, like you yourself, human being, you're a free living thing, or you are also active. They have those that are fixed at one place. Mostly they are sister or sedentary. And we have those also in your body. Those are, those are called the parasites. We will consider as we go along whether they are free living or they are also fixed. Then habitat. Either you live in water bodies which are called aquatic or you are terrestrial on land. Now let me take some few minutes to explain body cavity, which we'll use as you go on. Let's assume there's an egg. Fowl, before they lay the eggs, the males have fertilized the egg. Human beings too, our females also have eggs which are fertilized by the sperm. Once they fuse, whatever they form is called the zygote. After they fusing in the nucleus, the entire cell will start undergoing cell division. So one egg will divide into two. The two cells will divide into two again becomes four. The four divide becomes eight. Eight to divide becomes 16, 32, and so on they will keep dividing and they become a mass, a round ball with plenty cells in it. 
as they divide, the size will increase a little bit. But at a point, many substances will enter the egg, many things will take place. And these plenty cells which has formed a round mass of a ball, the cells on its own will start changing into uh, different shapes. Remember, when there were 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 120, whatever going, they look the same. No difference. Undifferentiated. So in biology, when they look same, same cells, we use the word undifferentiated. Then, as they have become plenty, certain things goes on in this divided cells. Then they start to change shape. They start to organize themselves based on shape, size, and other factors. All that we see is that these plenty cells will arrange itself in three layers of cells. So, the plenty cells now arrange themselves in three layers. So we have the outer group. Outer cells. Then we have the middle cells. We are going to have the inner here, the inner cells. It happens in every developing zygote to embryo. These three layers of cells are going to perform something when we become matured. Or these cells are telling us whatever body we have today was in that stage. So we call it the embryonic stage. Now this embryonic stage, we are saying that the cells have been arranged into three layers. The outer one is called the ectoderm. The middle one is called the mesoderm. And the inner one is called the endoderms. So, three layers are seen. Once you have these three layers at the embryonic stage, and you grow also with it, then we are saying that you have three body layers. Now let's go a little bit deeper. The outer cells are cells that when you grow, because on their outer, they will become your integument or your skin. So prior to growing up in your mother's womb, these cells have already arranged themselves to cells that will form our skin. But when they are at that stage, we call the ectoderm. Those that will form your bone and a lot of inner muscles are called the mesoderm. And our organs like our kidney, our digestive tracts, all these ones form our inner, have, will develop from our inner cells and we call them endodermis. So once you have all these three, then we say you are triploblastic. But for some, the middle layer may not form. Instead of forming into cells, they rather become a jelly-like or gelatinous layer or jelly-like material so it doesn't become cells so for them since the middle is not a cell we can only count two layers of cells in such organisms and for them we'll call them diploblastics so for them they only have outer cells and the inner cells. But the middle, we did not form a cell, so we call it middle layer. We call it meso, means middle, but we say mesoglea, which is jelly, so glea means the gel. So the middle gel. So for them, they have only two layers. Now, the middle layer, let's go back to triple plastic. If this, the middle layer mostly for human beings becomes our bone and our muscles, 
let's say we are like earthworm, which is only muscles. There are no bones there. Once we form the middle layer, so let's draw it again, the outer layer. The middle layer sometimes can be full of muscles, occupying all the middle layer there. So this middle layer can be full of muscles. In that case, there is no space because the outer is our skin and it's fully cells. Our inner is our digestive system. So there's nothing there. But the middle is what some, something can happen. There are situations that the middle muscles can divide themselves into two. One getting closer to our skin to support our skin and one getting closer to our digestive tract to also give it some support. So once they separate into two, there will be a space between our skin with the muscles from the mes mesoderm, our digestive tract with some of the same mesoderm cells close to it, and there will be a gap there. Once there's a gap, the gap is called the cavity in biology, and cavity is called coelom. So let's draw it again. So outer, so this will be our inner, then some of the muscles will get closer to the outer and some of the muscles will get closer to the inner leaving a space here and the space is called cavity and cavity is called coelom so compared to the top one which it was full of muscles they were, they, they, that means that there was no form of space there so once there's no form of space, we'll use the word acylum. So a acylum. And if there was space, we say coelom. These are the two things I think you need to grab. As you go along, you will get a clearer picture. So the first thing is that three layers may develop during the embryonic stage. And when you go up, it may also show up. If you have the three, we say triploblastic. You have two, we say diploblastic. If those with the triploblastic, there's space in the mesoderm layer, then we say there's a cavity we call coelom. Like human beings, from our intestines to our skin, there's a space there. For so those with that and it's full of muscle, we say they are acylomates. So there is a clearer picture of what I was trying to explain. So we have space here, and some of the same muscle go around the skin, and some protect the digestive tract. So the space is called coelom. Here there is no space, so we say acylomate. And for this one, there are some of the muscles do not go around the digestive; it only goes around the skin area. And uh, it's not continuous, so we say it is pseudo silomate, though there's cavity there. So now let's start with our first phyla. Phylum, sorry. The phylum nidaria. These are aquatic organisms, usually living in marine, but few are fresh water. And some can even be found on moist soil. When you take them, they appear a sac like or vast like so let's take a picture of them and look at it and easy to describe them they will come back to the characteristics first of all you see a space in the middle so that's a big space but this space is not in between two layers of cells so this space is called the cavity where food passes now at the top, you see these thread-like things we call tentacles. Then what the shape? We say it is vast-like or sac-like. So this shape is what we say it is vast-like or sac-like. So first thing, sac-like, vast-like, or then it is soft. If you're able to touch them, they are soft because will come to eight mesoglea issue. Then at the top, we have these thread things going up and down, we call the tentacles. 
on the tentacles are certain the yellow thing or orange thing you see on your screen are fixed on the tentacles these ones are called the nidocytes in the nidocytes are threads that we call nematocysts if you dare get them angry they will discharge this thread which have some barbs some hooks at the edge that can pierce your skin so for, for when they want to eat they use it when they want to defend themselves they use it so first thing you'll notice that there's tentacles on the tentacles are needles needles uh, needocytes on the needocytes are nematocysts and the word nidaria comes from the word nema which is thread that's the latinized form so let's go on the other thing you're supposed to know is that this body that covers the entire big cavity in the middle has been expanded over here to show two layers of cells the more greener one facing the inside of the cavity is referred to the endodermis layer and they should have had a middle layer called the mesoderm but unfortunately this did not develop it rather became a gel so we call it the mesoglea then the outer is called the ectoderm so how many body cells you see three layers but which among the layers which one have cells only two so the two layers will be called the diploblastic organism because they have two body layers and the middle is a gel so because of that gel when you hold them it makes them feel soft as soft organisms so these are the few things you should know about nidaria take your time and look at the picture before we move it on okay whatever i have here is an example of an organism called hydra so this is the hydra you have there using it to explain the nidaria okay so let's go over it they as you said they are in water they appear as vast like and they are radially symmetrical when you want to cut them any angle this way can give you half can also this option can also divide them again and you're going to get more than two ways or three ways to still cut them and still get equal halves that are mirror images then you saw that there's only one mouth but no let's say anus no other outer opening the same one mouth food will pass there where you saw the tentacles gathering that same place waste will be removed from that place and i've spoken about tentacles and its function now for nidarians we can say they are polymorphism there's a bit polymorphism why because the organism is not like human being that you have one type of body whether a man or a woman you stand upright we see you you have same features for them they come in two different forms either you have the hydra i showed to you the green thing that appears standing erect with the base fixed to something so we call them sessile or sessile they don't they hardly move that means they don't move they hardly move then because they are fixed at one place and they hardly move we say they are sessile we have we are going to show you the umbrella type the one in the middle here which is like an umbrella also have tentacles like we have at the hydra tentacles this way and they also use it to move capture defend but because they have the umbrella type we call them the medusa yes the word is medusa you've heard head of medusa before the head with plenty snake-like things on the head so we also call the, those with the umbrella type the medusa and those with the straight type facing up as the polyp 
So either you appear as this, or you appear as the umbrella. You appear as either a polyp, or you appear as a medusa. And they are all the same organism. So they can appear in two forms and refer to as polymorphism. Or you can start as one form. Then as you are growing, you change to the other form. Some two live singly. They hardly join a lot. Others live in colonies. They are a group all gathered together at one place. And they work together to make their environment successful for them to habitat. Then in reproduction, they use two means. First, they reproduce asexual. And this is what we, they do with the asexual. When they are about to give birth asexual, they will develop a bud or an outgrowth at the side. So all of a sudden, something will start growing at your abdomen side, which is going to be a new human being. Or let's say the way our ladies get pregnant, and the human being will be in the lady, all of a sudden you just cut off the human being, the new one, put it down, and that has become another human being. That means you don't need two people. The person living just grows something on the side, which is part of his body. When it grows, when it gets to the matured stage, it can be free on its own. Then you just cut it off. It falls and starts growing as a different organism. And that is, is what we call the bad system. Or they may reproduce sexually. When they reproduce sexually, the same individual, the same one hydra, depend on types. For some, the male gamete is on the same organism. And the female gamete is on the same organism. So you can say they are hermaphrodite. It has both male and female on the same organism. But usually, their sperm don't fertilize, they go to another. Scientists are still checking whether they can. So that is how they reproduce. They either reproduce by burden or reproduce by sexual means, where male and female gametes are produced. For some, the male gametes may be in one organism, for some of their classes. And the female may be in another organism altogether, and the gametes has to fuse. So on your screen are pictures of class hydrozoa, where the hydra belongs, and they are solely polyps. Then the scyphozoa, where the medusa belongs to, or the, sorry, that is the medusa structure. And we have organisms over there. We have the antozoa to look at them like flowers, as we have it over there. So these are the three we want you to, but you are not required of Nidaria. Now let's get to another interesting one that you are familiar with, the phylum platyhelminthes. I believe you've heard tapeworm before. That's why you take a drug called dewormer. Yes, they belong to the group called platyhelminthes. Platy means flat, then worms means helminth, helminth. So flat worms. That's the meaning, flat worms. And the reason we call them tape worm is like you have a tape measure, which are tailors and seamstress use as flat like a tape measure. And you also see that there are some marks on a tape measure. But what is unique about them is that all the organisms in this group are flat. For human beings, we have our ventra, we have our dorsa, we have our latra. They are not compressed, they are space. But if these two were pressed together, then we say that my dorsa and my ventra has been almost pressed together, and we say dorsal ventrally flattened. That's the meaning, dorsal ventrally flattened. They exhibit what we call bilateral symmetry. All the organisms in platyhelminthes exhibit bilateral symmetry. Then I believe when I mentioned this word, it to be okay now. Triploblastic or tripoblastic means they have three body layers. No cavity. So they have three body layers. It means that in their mesoderm, 
there is no space in the middle, there is full of muscles that fill the place. Another feature of them is that they are no vascular system, like we have blood in us. Blood needs to pass through blood vessels like veins, arteries, and capillary to send substance from one place to the other. So that when, assuming you eat from one place, it gets to the other. So the question is, if they don't have vascular system, how do they eat? How do they excrete? How do they do a lot of things? We will study about that. So there's no vascular system. What they do is that most things pass across their body. Most are parasitic. Most of them are parasitic and few are free living. Parasitic means that they live inside us or on our body and derive food or some benefit from us. And at the end of the day, they will cause harm to us. That makes them parasites. If they are not causing harm to us, and but we are not benefiting from them, that becomes commensalism. So at this stage, they are parasitic. They are mouth except the cystoid. Except the cystoid, all of them have mouth but no anus. Then, what you use to remove waste from your body is called kidney. What they use to remove waste, metabolic waste, is called uh, flame cells. Most of them will, will try and probably segment them, but most of them will say that as they are parasites and they are in you, your body system can do two things. The acid and the enzymes and the fluids in your body can affect them, can destroy their body too. So what they have to do is that they always have to have a thick lining around their body or have a system that can withstand. They may wash them away. So what these parasites do is that they have to have mechanisms to hold on to any part of our body so that even when we are washing them, they will not be dislodged. So they have hooks and suckers. So when I use the word sucker, I don't mean sucking fluid like taking something with a straw from a drink. No. Suckers or hooks are for holding. Then most of them are hermaphrodites. Another thing we didn't mention, which I'll take you back a little. When we did the hydra, you saw we have endoderm and ectoderm. When I showed you the drain, there was this. Let's go back. These cells, the endoderm and ectoderm cells, you have different cells in there. So it's like gland cells, food cells, nutritive cells for the endoderm, shear cells. All of them are there. You may have a group together at one place, other group at one place. But remember, before. When you have the same cells having the same function, we say you have tissue. But if that tissue and other tissues and other tissues come together to coordinate the activity for one specific function or a job to be done, then the entire structure they all find themselves in is called the organ. But these organs, they don't do that. They have tissues, but the tissues do not work as if in our heart, you have muscles, you have blood, you have body do is your body are not in the mind of co coordinating to get one function. So at that stage, we said they are at tissue level. They are not seeing different organs, different different organs in there. They are just scattered around with similar cells at some place, similar cells like that, and we say they are tissue levels. So at platyl mentis level, we are at system. So from tissue, we have we may have a nervous, a, we can't say organ, but system. So when the organs join together, they form systems. So at this level, we are having organisms that are having systems. So digestive system, locomotory system, productive system, nervous system excretory system, so we say they are system level. Usually, there are also some 
or most reproduce sexually, but some can also reproduce. So there's a picture of some of the platyamentous organisms. So look at planaria, flukes, and our favorite friend, the tapeworm. For your level, we'll study three classes. Class Tabularia, Class Trematoda, and Class Cystoda. So let's take them one after the other. The Class Tabularia are free-living organisms that mostly live in water. On the lower side of their body are some cilia that they used to beat when they walk under stones, leaves, and those stuck to some place if they want to stay. So you have this cilia under their body. Okay. Before we go on, have a look at this picture. Have a look at this picture for about 10 seconds. We are going to use this to describe all the characteristics you need to know. First of all, they are flat. Look at it like a paper. They are flat, so they belong to plat platyamentus, but they mostly live in water. Now, this is the upper side, dorsa. This is the dorsa part. What do you see? A tube like structure protruding out. It is like our throat, a place called pharynx. When we eat, we swallow our pharynx. But their pharynx come out of their body, and it's a place you may say that is your navel area. But yes, that's where you can see their mouth is found. On the middle part of the ventral side. And this is where, or what they use to feed. Another thing you are seeing is something like that. A human eye. We call it eye spot because it's mostly for detecting. Then you have an extensive digestive system. Another thing I mentioned was flame cells. So they have a lot of flame cells scattered all around their body. And we've expanded one of the flame cells. It's a tube-like structure with flagellum in them. And when water enters, it beats the flagellum we know from euglena will beat the water or the waste material for them to go out. When it's beat, it behaves like the flame of our candle. So we call the flame cells. So we call the flame cells. And this is what they use to remove all metabolic waste, which we term as excretion. So let's look at it for another 10 seconds and go back to our notes. Okay, let's go back. So you, you saw that the mouth is on the ventral surface. And they don't have suckers, anything, because they are not living in your body where you sweep them away. They are carnivorous. Usually they feed on small animals or when dead, when big animals die, they are small, small, the remains of their parts that usually drops down, they feed on them. So they don't feed on weeds or they are not herbivores. Then we saw something called eye spots, which is not a real eye like our own. So some books you have that simple eyes, but their job of these eyes is not actually for seeing, it's for detecting light. Then they reproduce using gametes. One will release gametes, the other will receive it, and then the other also releases it, the other also receives it. So you can say they are hermaphrodite, but one person do not fertilize itself. Then the asexual is regeneration. What does it mean? A part just after the pharynx, the organism can divide into two. We say tear itself into two. So we have a downside and an upside by some mechanism. The upside can grow back the downside and downside can also grow the top. Something scientists are still searching for clues and answers to it. So when they are growing the other part or the other half, 
you see they are regenerating the other cells or other parts so we refer to as regeneration remember that this one it did not require two parents to send gametes which will be called sexual reproduction it required one parent to divide into two and grow the other half so it's an asexual process now it's also called tabularia for a reason when they are moving in water they create this turbulence in the water so it's like the water shakes a little bit where whenever they move around that's why they have the name tabularia example of some organisms there are the planaria and dendrocelium please get the spellings well anytime you are spelling anything with a scientific name start with capital so we have planaria or dendrocelium and we have the scientific name sites they live inside us or they live in invertebrates or in their life cycle they require two different hosts one we call the primary host, one we call the secondary host. These are the mollusk and human beings. I believe you heard histosoma before, or fasciola hepatica. These are liver flukes, they affect our liver. Schistosoma affect our blood. So, what it means is that they are either endoparasitic or ectoparasitic. They can live in your blood, they can live in our intestines, they can live on our liver, and can live on our lungs. As I said, they know your body has secretions that will destroy them. So what would they do? They will find ways and means to make their skin thicker. So we say that that thing they add is saying that they have a thick cuticle. That means their skin is a thick cuticle. That will protect them from the host digestive enzymes. Then they have oral and ventral suckers. So let me show you a picture so watch the tip here and that one. So oral top ventral suckers down. If they get used to uh, hold on to your body parts so that nothing can dislodge them from your body. So let's go back. So these are pictures of trematoda. They are in our body if you get infested with one of them. So they have no eyes, no cilia, like cilia because they're planarias. They no eyes because they're in your body. Your, your entire system is viscous, lot of fluid. What would they use eyes for? Fluid will get into the eyes and start. So they have no eyes, but they know how to get to their target through your body. Then they have long uterus that store many eggs. So anytime you defecate or something, most of your fecal matter releases a lot of these eggs. To ensure that their life cycle is sustained. And they may have two hosts, as I said. Walk in the water, they pierce through your skin and go back into your body. Examples of them are fasciola hepatica. That's your liver fluke. Schistosoma, when people renate and they renate blood. So you call them the blood disease or blood flukes. Usually the name for trematoda is called the flukes. We have sheep flukes. So when we the sheep are affected and we also eat them. The sheep are affected and we also eat them. We can be affected with this. That's why they will tell you to cook well or grill well or apply heat of enough temperature to kill some of these things because they can be in their muscles, which the heat, if not well prepared, cannot get them. And let's get to the last one you are more familiar with, the cystoda. Like their brothers, trematodes, they are also endoparasitic or endoparasites, usually in our intestines or guts. Same, because your ACL from your stomach will be hot, your digestive juices will be hot and can affect them. They also have a thick cuticle around their body. But let's go and look at a picture first. So on your right, so on your far left on a green leaf, 
is a typical tapeworm taken from an organism. Look at how long it is meandering, going up and down. It can be very long. But because they keep folding, like the second picture, the black and white in the middle, with names on them, it can fold itself and hide in your intestines. Then, an electron microscope image. You see something on the head. There's something that looks like eyes. Please, they are not eyes. Then you see something like a rasta hair. They are not rasta hair. So let's look at the naming on the far right. The whole head is called the scolex. But the scolex have parts. We have a terminal projected ring at the head which we call the rostellum. So it's like a ring at the tip of the head, on which we have the hooks. And as I said, hooks are supposed to pierce through your intestines or any part of your body to hold on well so that you cannot dislodge them. Same with the suckers. To give them more holding, they have the suckers too. So not for sucking. Then you see this thing like the, the lines on a tape measure. Each line demarcates one segment. But here, this segment will come to round worms and segmented worms. And we'll explain what proper segmentation is. It's not required, it's not said to be a segment. But you see this thing, we use the word segment here. For us not to get it wrong, we use the word proglotite. So this segmented or small repeated segment or repeated parts is called the proglotide. So the repeated equal parts of the body is called the proglotide. The young ones start from the neck. So at the far end, the star end, are the matured ones. So... I think I've showed you everything on the image. We saw something called proglotide, we call equal repeated segments. Then we've seen the suckers and the hooks. And where they are attached to the hooks are attached to is called the rostellum. Then for them they possess a digestive system, but they don't have a mouth like we saw in the planaria group. No. So when we eat, the food just diffuses from our intestines to all the proglotide. The reason why we said equal repeated, if you have digestive system in the first one, you have it in the second. So if let's say there are 300 proglotides, each one is going to have digestive system, excretory system, reproductive system. So if one breaks off, if one breaks off and go, it can grow. The eggs there and anything that can fuse, it can grow. So again, they don't have a mouth, which is used for sucking. But the food that we eat just diffuse across their body into their digestive system. And each segment has the same set of things in the next segment. So it looks like they are behaving like the spirogyra, where everybody has so. But here, they have one coordinating level system, and they have some parts the same. Then tapeworms do not have organs of locomotion. Why? Because they are in our body. They are not free living. But fluid and other secretions help them move from one place to the other. Examples of these organisms are tinea solem and tinea saginata. Commonly, we just say tapeworm. So tapeworm is not only in us, it's in all other mammals. Like pigs, can be in your dog, can be in your goats, can be in your sheep, can be in your cattle. So for all the worms, we advise that when you eat, please and please again, do well to cook them well. Then if there are drugs you can take periodically to just bring them out, like our dewema, do well and take them within that stipulated time. So these are the pictures 
that you need to help remind you for today's lesson. So at the end of today's lesson, we have focused on two phyla. Phyla nideria, which are diploblastic and radially symmetrical, live in aquatic environment and can undergo sexual and asexual production. And unique about them is the tentacles that have a needle site on them, which have a tread nematocyst. They can also use those things for defense. And we have two forms of them. The straight sisal type, which looks like a vase, or the umbrella type, which you call the medusa. The straight one is called the polyp. Then we came to the platyal mantis. The flat type, all that we saw are flat, from planaria to flukes to tapeworm. They are all flat. This has been a brief discussion of the major characteristics of these two phyla. And our next study will try and focus on the roundworm nematoda and also focus on the segmented worm called analida. If you have any question, you can drop it. But we meet again. I have become, I'm your teacher, Osel Kwame Amwaten, taking you through phyla of kingdom animalia, specifically Nideria and Plati Hementis. To we meet again, say it's a wrap and say bye bye. Thank you very much. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.